Good evening. Welcome to the Seminars for Webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is on cross-border payments in the Indian context. Uh, for those of, of our viewers who are joining in from the India and Asia Pacific region, uh, this is a rerun of our webinar that we conducted in December. Uh, thank you for your patience for joining us and uh, we hope you like what follows. Uh, today's webinar is focused on all those foreign organizations who are intending to or doing in business in India and we are trying to tell them today about what are the various implications uh, from the tax, regulatory and financial perspective uh, for cross-border payments coming in and out of India. As such, let me just take you through the focus of this. Um, our basic premise and idea is to give a generic overview of all key implications. Um, we are going to try and join the common threads that run across various types of international transactions that happen uh, between uh, counterparts, their subsidiaries, uh, their vendors, their customers in India. Uh, we're not uh, at this point in time, I'd like to clarify that we are not looking at uh, providing details on each and every type of transactions, obviously because of time limitations and the complexity in the nature of transaction demands that uh, each set of transactions or uh, uh, payments be looked at specifically separately. But uh, the idea is to join all the common threads together. Uh, the key considerations for us uh, are banking requirements, uh, legal requirements, Taxation obviously is a very, very major uh, consideration for everybody. Uh, more importantly, since India is such a very documentation heavy uh, jurisdiction, uh, looking at all the compliances and documentation that are required for each kind of transactions. Uh, these are primarily the key bullets that we will be focusing on uh, throughout the rest of this webinar. Uh, our webinar is not going to be more than uh, 30 to 40 minutes. That's our intended time. So if we run over by a few minutes, I apologize, I apologize in advance. Um, with me on my uh, right is Kapil Dua, the Director of Financial Consulting for Sanam S4. And I'm just going to hand the mic over to him now. Uh, Kapil, if you could just maybe begin with uh, inward payments first and tell us about what are the implications for all inward transfers into India. And probably then we'll take it out from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, morning, evening. It's a very good topic to be honest, where we are talking about how do we help or how do we assist uh, inward payments uh, and you're transferring funds uh, from your overseas location, from your holding company into your Indian company. And how and what are the regulations, what are the documentation, what are the taxes which you would need to consider when you're transferring funds into India. Let me first talk about what are the categories of payment which which are generally uh, covered in the inward payments when we are when we are receiving funds into India? So you you would be having your subsidiary, you would be having your branch office, liaison office, project office, and any such kind of setup. And in fact, you have your vendors, you have your other service providers in India. So what type of payments which we are actually talking about here? First of all, a capital weight of your Indian subsidies. So whenever you want to uh, send money into India, another, another way to trust funds into India. Uh, since when you have service provider working for you in India, they are setting business to you. They are delivering some sort of services to you, and you end up paying commissions to them. So you are dropping funds directly to their bank account. Uh, payment for your vendors. Your and payment for purchase of components and well. So sometimes you need to import goods uh, back in your own country and you don't need to make payments for purchase of goods. So these are typically, I would say, five, five, five categories or five, six categories of payments, which we will talk about how do we handle them uh, in India. So what are the key considerations? So, it's very, very important to think about from all perspectives, which are the acts, which are the regulations which we need to consider. 
about really what phosphorus funds into India. So to start with, for example, uh, foreign organizations, when they are sending money into India, are they liable to the board taxes? So we have in India something called tax deducted tax source, uh, in another language with all the taxes. In fact, as per the Indian income tax tax, foreign parties are also liable to the board taxes when they, when they are making payments to the Indian vendors, when they are making payments for the uh, services which they are buying from India. Generally, it's very difficult from a practical perspective to the board taxes because a foreign party like your home office will think, look, we are not governed by the Indian tax laws. We are only governed by Australian tax laws or, or, or any other foreign national tax laws. Why would we consider ourselves to the whole taxes? But as per the Indian tax laws, foreign parties are also liable to the whole taxes when they are making payment to Indian vendors. What are the what are, what are the other documentation that you need when you're making payments to India? For example, agreements or contracts should be in place that should be a part of we are making payments uh, into India so that the Indian uh, child account and the Indian CP would know that why the payment has been come to India. Also, the implication is also one of the big factor here. When you are processing funds into India uh, to your own related parties like your subsidiaries or branch office, your regulations, and uh, is there any impact on the prices uh, for the payments? Bankers requirement. So, what are the requirement? Uh, Suggested by the Indian Banking Regulation and Reserve Bank of India are quite a cheap management act when the funds are received in India. So, for example, it is very, very important to remember that when you are transferring funds into India, do make sure that while transferring funds online on your banking portal, you do need to say the purpose of transfer. Is it a purpose? Equity capital is the purpose, is that the payment for services is the purpose towards loan? What is the Purpose of transfer funds in India, which is very important to discuss in other slides moving forward in this webinar. And uh, Indian Bank has issued a certificate called Foreign Inward Remittance Certificate, and that becomes like a, like a major document to show to the authority that the money has landed in India from all the legitimate sources and what was the purpose to avoid any issues later on from a money laundering. Or illegal money coming into India. So that document is very, very important. And the purpose of remittance is also important when you pass the funds, uh, which will publish, which will be written on that document by the Indian Bank of And of course, the exchange cost, which you need to think about when you pass the funds and service tax regulation, which is equivalent to VAT in some of the countries. So it's important to understand uh, when the funds are being transferred into India. What kind of invoices have been raised by the Indian vendors or Indian subsidiaries? Is the service that's liable on that? Or the Indian vendors or Indian subsidiaries or yours required to deposit service tax on their reverse charge basis? So these are a the few considerations I would say which are very, very important for you to think. It's, it's also important to understand that what are the other specific points which you do need to keep in your mind when you're transferring funds into India. For example, we talk about sending money into India by way of capital infusion. So, when you transfer funds by way of capital into India, you don't need to uh, understand taxes per se because there are no taxes uh, in India on your equity capital, but there are stamp duties. So, when you issue shares, when an Indian company is issuing shares to a foreign resident who has transferred funds into India for equity capital, there could be stamp duties for increase of authorized capital of the company. Uh, for example, providing loans to the subsidiaries. I mean, in general, loan providing or what's set. Setting loans is open only to some of the sector, like power sector, railways, few other sector where ECD is allowed, but on a, on a simple consulting model, like you send money for the working capital of a consulting company. It is a restricted area to send in, uh, funds into India in the form of loans. Now, what are the service tax regulations? What are the holding taxes that we have previously talked about? What are the different disbursements of taxes to government authorities as a foreign banker would require?
organization uh, one time approval I want to make it second people to the same year or in the future to the same vendor. It should be an agreement because the Indian tax authority would ask, okay, why go over to the purpose of the payment? So an agreement define all the contractual liabilities, the, uh, the time for payment receipts, service tax, and VAT and other liabilities. So it would be good to have the agreement for, for more and more payments. Okay, and uh, the other question that we have uh, from our viewer is that um, their bankers insist on transferring funds um, directly to INR in India. So, is that uh, okay or uh, do you suggest something else? I would suggest to avoid that. I would suggest to, when you're transferring funds into India, try to send foreign currency like US dollar, or Australian dollars, or any other foreign currency. And in foreign currency, do not try to convert currency at your own level. So, when the money landed in India, your Indian bank account so anyway convert that, even if you can you can have the EFC account, which is a foreign currency account in India. So, you can have multi currency accounts, you can keep foreign currency in your Indian entity bank, plus you can hold your foreign currency within two months of landing into India. Uh, but I mean, the, the basic question is should be. Converted to INRs. So, so, one of the very important criteria that money should land in India in, in foreign currency. There are some ways how do you get out of that, but it's very complicated because you do need the interbank, there is a group bank school group that the money has actually landed in India in foreign currency. So, and then also for capital inclusion, for example, we do need to think as the Bank of India from the Panama Exchange point of view that the money arrived from overseas in foreign currency. All right, we have a few questions already, but uh, looking at the time, uh, we can um, uh, take these questions on at at the end of the session or after that. Uh, moving on, Kapil, can you just now talk about outward payments? I know inward payments is a little simpler process, but can you just talk more about outward payments from India and uh, what are the implications thereof? I would say that it is definitely more restricted area. So we don't buy any payment going out of India. We do want to restrict money going out of India. Uh, and I'm, I'm just saying from a bank of India point of view and foreign currency going out. Yeah. But yes, it is it is one of the important factors to understand how the outward payments are uh, going out of India, what kind of outward payments. So let's talk about what are the categories of payments. So for example, Indian company, Indian uh, office of yours would like to reverse cost to your home country, to the parent company, or parent organization. Management charges, so sometimes you spend time on the India business sitting overseas. Uh, your salary, your hours which you spend on the India project, you would like to charge that to the Indian entity. Uh, dividend payments, so when the uh, Indian entity have profits in India and the dividends are 
the profit having the cloud for Indian form of business, provide these and these for technical services. So when you have an Indian licensee or when you have somebody who's working for you and using your technical know-how, you know, uh, 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 Indian entities is being payment to acknowledge your technical know-how. And of course, the payments for purchases. So when the when the uh, Indian entities is purchasing goods or products from overseas within the related party or non related party, so Indian party has to Indian entity has to make a payment for those purchases. I think what are the important uh, key areas or requirements for such transaction, which you should definitely keep in mind? I mean, agreement has been talked about previously. It is important to have agreement now. In this area, which is output payment, I would say even for single payment agreement is required mm -hmm. because uh, your Indian charter company, your Indian CPA, you have to go to an Indian CA to analyze whether the tax is applicable on this payment. So, as per Indian income tax act and Indian tax laws, generally a service is taxable in India. It bases on wherever. So, even if you have provided a service to the Indian entity and that service has been rendered overseas or provided by you, say, overseas, you still need a certificate from Indian CPA which would prove that whether the tax in India, which is corporate tax, is paid on that service or not, whether those services are taxable in or not. So, in order to get that, who delivered it, what kind of services, which section it goes into. What are the other regulations? So it's important to have the agreement. Custom bills. So when we import goods into India, we do not have to make payments and we cannot make the payment. Maybe Indian entities cannot make the payment unless we have all the custom documents. We have the supporting documents which talks about when the goods are handed, what were the FOB costs of the goods, what are the custom duties which we have paid. So those custom documents are important. So do keep a track of each and every transaction. Sometimes I've seen. Previously, that you know, it's very difficult to keep a track of each import. And when we sit down with the bank to make a payment, they will say, Look, we cannot make a payment because the custom documents are not proper. So, on what basis we can make the payment? So, it's important to keep track of all the custom documents. Uh, Indian accountant have to online and furnish a report that so and so payment has to go overseas. So we have to file that form online with the Indian tax authorities. That's also very important. And then what are the withholding tax implications? I mean, you must have seen previously if you have if you have any engagement with Indian subsidiaries or Indian that wherever payment is going out from India, or wherever funds are going out from India, there are four basic requirements. So, Indian entity or Indian uh, service provider, I mean, who shall responsible for funds from India, we will ask where the withholding tax is being applicable or So, for that, you do really need to go to an Indian CPA. Do the tax registration is important. I mean, if you have as a foreign entity, first of all, as a foreign entity, you can apply PAN number and tax registration in India. So, if, if you have a tax registration, this is a pan in India, the tax rate goes lower. That's the treaty between India and US, India, UK, India, and Australia. Does it have anything significant? Given by your own home country, uh, tax uh, jurisdiction or tax authority. So, you do need to apply to your tax office in your home country, which will be a very simple certificate proving that you are a tax resident of so and so country, say Australia, UK, US, uh, just to prove that you would like to take a benefit of India. So, in order to take a bit of better tax rates, which are given under the tax treaties between both the countries, you do need to furnish this certificate, which is given by your home country tax officer, that you are a tax resident of that country. 
and it, it, it generally operates on a daily basis. So remember to keep a track closely for the tax credit as per your home country. So you might need to apply that next year when you receive more payments from the tax. And, and, the, and the four most important is the declaration for uh, no Uh, it is important because the definition is the word given between the tax treaties and it talks about that do you have a kind of a establishment or a presence in India which as per definition could be called as permanent. And once the you qualify to have an establishment, the tax rates are different. Having withholding taxes in India at 40% on your profits instead of 10% on your sales. I mean, on the whole turnover or stage or service data. So, it is a different uh, treatment of tax that you have on establishment. So, do analyze whether you have on establishment or not. And sometimes we do get questions from our clients and other, other uh, 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 receiver of payments from India that if they have an in India, do they need to file a tax return? As per the general law, Yes, you do have a tax return, but if you have not get any tax return in India, you can still file very easy in the return and there is no uh, more complication. But if you have got those tax uh, uh, returns and, and it's better to file a tax return in order to pay, which we discuss in some of other, I can definitely move to the next slide. Which one. What are the key things to remember when you are uh, getting a payment from India? And it's very important to understand that, for example, we talked about the rolling taxes, we talked, we talked about, uh, can, we, can we actually think of that because we don't have a number of taxation over the limit, uh, once the income is specifically taxed in India, would that income be again taxed in our own country? The answer it should not be, because we do have a, a, a DT double A, double taxation over the limit. So the same income should not be taxed in both the countries. So, in order to avoid that and in order to gain the benefit that tax rate celebrated is important, if the tax has been withheld in India, say 10%, you can definitely gain that tax in your home country while filing your own tax return. So, for example, you have you are supposed to get taxes in your home country on, the, on your profits, then you can claim a credit of these taxes which have been withheld in India, provided you have abandoned them in India, provided you have filed your tax returns in India. And those tax returns you can show to your home country tax officer that you have paid taxes in India on same income. However, sorry, and is it just a credit system or do you get refunds also from the government in many cases? This is as you you will not get a refund, it's just a credit system. So, for example, if the tax has been deducted in India at $100, it will is say ninety dollars. You can adjust this number. Okay. Ninety, but not, you can adjust this hundred and the rest of the hundred. But you will not get a refund if there is no tax liability in your home country. Now, as we also talked about in the inward inheritances or inward payments coming into India, if when the payment is out of India or uh, between the related parties. So, in order to avoid any uh, litigation going forward, the non surprising documentation, the non surprising study, the margins which you are going to keep in India is very, very important to understand that those margin and non surprising regulations should be clearly there. This is all issues which we need to understand. For example, imports. So, when there is an imports in India, Between the, between the two parties, there is a special regulation, the March regulation, where the money is offered uh, transaction between for the imports between the related parties and uh, the import of goods have been happening between say subsidy and pay and all good companies. The Indian custom officer can say that so we do have you know the, the right to control pricing, so I would like to tax you in a different way. So I would like to transfer this import payment to a special branch regulation, which means your goods could be stuck in India. So always remember 
get your when you're selling goods or products uh, in your area, in your own related parties, do consider to go for a special valuation launch uh, from day one. Otherwise, some other goods will be stuck for three months, six months, and you end up paying different charges at the Indian customs. So, so it's important to understand what are the implications when the import is happening in India. I mean, goods are coming into India from one of the group country or a related country or parent country, for example. Then the other things very important are customer abilities, what are the bank requirements, when the bank is asking, asking you all those things. I mean, I will ask for E2, which is also very important when you are asking fund that. How are you transferring funds? From where you are getting this fund uh, tax like on currency to transfer funds. So they will ask you to make a declaration that you have either purchased this fund currency from the open market, like from forest data, to make this payment and income from which you want to transfer this funds. That's similarly correct. Uh, again, non-profit organization are also very, very important to understand. I mean, if you have a if you have a non-profit setup like section B company or trust or society in India, it is very difficult to make a payments from that foreign uh, from that. Non-profit or make a payment from a non-organization that is set up in India to a foreign organization, which could be a problem making a non-profit. So, so always think again when you're trying to set up a non-profit that taking money out from India from a non-profit which is registered in India is very, very difficult. Again, I would say the last but not the least that uh, you would like to make further investments into other regions like Asia region, for example, you want you have subsidy in India and you want to set up an office in Bangladesh or on Nepal or Pakistan or, or, or nearby region and you want to invest into those regions from India. So we do have specific regulation on overseas direct investment. So whenever a money is being moving from Indian subsidiary of yours, further other uh, countries which are which will become a down level subsidiaries of India, India entity, then you will be provided to the overseas direct investment regulation, which talks about that you can only invest up to four hundred percent of the network of the Indian entity. So it's a especially different regulation which we call as only regulations in India. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, I'm going to pick your brains on a couple of questions that have been coming in now from our uh, viewers. Uh, number one, and I think this is a very relevant question, uh, is that can foreign companies make their Indian subsidy to Indian vendors? No, I mean they can, but I would say don't even try. I mean, when you when you start making those kinds of payments, uh, for example, when you want to make a payment on for Indian vendor fees, first of all, you do need to be no taxes. You do need to understand the service tax and VAT obligations. So, and again, tax are not being deducted by the foreign party. Then the Indian tax officer will not allow this expenditure with the tax deducted. I mean, I can I can pull up one more question. Next to this, sometimes it happens to have a global contract, and you want to make a payment to a global vendor because you have, you have seven subsidiaries in the world. And when the overseas uh, bank account, for example, Australian uh, parent company making payment to Australian vendor for services delivered to Indian subsidiary. Of the Australian parent. So, this is also, I would suggest to avoid payment directly from overseas to overseas if you cannot, then before you tax. Pass on that direct cost to your Indian subsidiary's books and accounts. It will not be allowed as a tax deductible expenditure unless you deduct the voting tax on that. Um, thanks, Katalina. Another relevant question that we have is uh, how do I allocate? Uh, shared cost to my Indian subsidiary. Uh, um, obviously, I think our viewer is talking about uh, costs like management costs or technology costs or real estate costs that they want to allocate back to their Indian subsidiary. So, is that possible? And if yes, what are the 
typical application of such a uh, debit into India. Well, it's a very uh, interesting question, and, and it's it's probably uh, used as a method by companies to take us out of India uh, because sometimes India uh, is not a tax efficient way of taking funds, so they do charge the Indian company as a management cost. So or or fee for technical services or royalties or reimbursement of costs. So you can definitely consider all the tax implications. So regulate. There should be a constant pricing agreement which talks about what are the arms and prices, what are the control prices, are you charging the similar management cost already paid to your uncontrolled or non-controllable entities because transfer funds to parent company and subsidy have to control entities and you can fix any price. So in the in the office I will say look you do need to show me that this is the same price or management cost you have charged to somebody else who's not related. So that's important. Then what are the loading taxes? You do need to consult the Indian Chartered Accountant to uh, tell you whether the loading taxes are applicable or not. If the loading taxes are applicable, again, we go into the same method where you should be asked for a PAN number, a tax register certificate, no other establishment uh, certification. All that is required. All right, um, we have a few more questions, but we are running short of time at this moment. So what we are going to try and do is attempt these questions after the webinar over email or directly get in touch with you. Um, for those of you who may have other future questions, and uh, I obviously know since this is such a very uh, interesting if you at a later stage may have questions. So our contact details are on your screen. Uh, you can uh, get in touch with us anytime you want. Um, uh, we'll also be attending to the question over email um, so as we are running short of time I want to thank uh, all the viewers and also to thank Kapil for taking the time to explain all these intricate details in a very simple and specific manner uh, thank you so much thank you to our viewers uh, you've been very patient with us today and uh, week ahead and much. Thank you, couple. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.